Hello and welcome to this class. This is Educational Psychology, Module 3, Social Development. Within this class, uh, I'm going to be mostly focusing upon uh, middle childhood. And the intention here is, is that age range between 6 and 11 is a really formative time. And so I just want to kind of narrow in our lecture on that time. So when we look at the physical development during this time within middle childhood, it's really called the golden age of childhood. Now, overall, children are relatively healthy during this period. Growth rates slow and children start gaining about five to seven pounds in weight and about two inches in height each year. So there's a slow, steady growth rate. Many children begin to slim down as their torso becomes longer. And a child in this age uh, can have strong muscles and increased lung capacity that enables them to play for long periods of time. They have a, an immense amount of energy and they can just run and run and run. And I'm sure that you can remember back in the days when you were that age and just how uh, fantastic it was as far as your energy level. Now this is an age when many children begin to play organized sports. Their bodies are well equipped for doing this and they really enjoy it. The, as long as they understand the rules of the sport. Now however, it's been said that sports are best for children if their parents stay home. And this is because parents have the tendency to focus primarily on competition and less on instilling a sense of enjoyment and competency in the game. And this can lead to tension and hostility and can be a real source of discouragement for a child who doesn't always win. Unfortunately, such children may give up and become less active and experience a, a sort of burnout at a fairly young age. Uh, now, childhood obesity as well has been on the increase within North America, really most English-speaking countries. Uh, it's estimated that between 16 and 33 percent of North American children are obese. And this doesn't mean that they have a, a few, that they're just a few pounds overweight. It's defined as being at least 20 percent over your ideal weight. Childhood obesity has actually tripled in the last generation. And obesity is defined as having a body mass index greater than or equal to the 95, 95th percentile for sex and age. Now, children who suffer from obesity can be the subject of ridicule, of bullying, of later cardiovascular disease, of bone or joint problems, and also type 2 diabetes. And so it's important for parents and for schools to always be mindful of the nutritional values within schools, to reevaluate what they offer in cafeterias and in beverage machines, and to ensure that there is a level of physical activity within the life of the school. Um, now, years ago, a popular meal being served once a week was chicken nuggets, a roll, and mashed potatoes. And if you look at the breakdown of that, it was about 1,200 calories um, and three times the amount of sodium recommended, a massive amount of cholesterol and fat. 
And on top of that, students would also have access to ice cream and cookies and chips and soda at lunchtime. And so it's not surprising that we had this problem. Now, fortunately, schools are much better nowadays at what they offer within schools. But we also need to be mindful not to fall back into those traps. So it's important to care for the nutritional value uh, of our students, to, to ensure that they are getting the nutrients that they need and that we, as schools, if we do provide access to foods, that they are healthy nutritional foods. Now, a little bit about the cognitive development of middle childhood. As we mentioned before, there is a stage in this that would correlate with middle childhood from Jean Piaget, and then this would be his third stage, the concrete operational stage of intelligence. And this involves the ability to understand the physical or the tangible world. So this is the concrete thinking. It's later when um, the child transitions to formal operations that you have abstract thinking. But in this stage is concrete operational thinking. And here the child can classify objects in many different ways. They recognize that objects re retain their identity even if modified. So for example, scrambled eggs are still eggs. And they recognize and identify uh, the quantity of things. So it becomes easier for school-aged children to reverse a set of operations in math or to understand that moving backward in a set of procedures can bring one back to the beginning point. So reciprocity is understood. And a child recognizes, for example, that the water level, if a, the wa water level rises in a container that is narrow and falls, in a container that is wide, uh, that it's the same amount of water. So there's a sense of concrete connection and understanding of the physical world that is there. And as far as information processing, remember there's that classical model that is fairly consistent throughout uh, life. And in this classical theory of memory, where we use the analogy of a computer that helps us understand how memories are built, the first location for information uh, to enter is through the senses. So seeing and hearing and touching and smelling a stimulus is the first step to forming a memory. Most of what comes into our sensory register is there for only a split second, and then is either dismissed or moved to our working, or what we call our short-term memory. Short-term or working memory has a limited capacity. And so the, these pieces of information, uh, there's a limited amount that can be within that. Now, information must be rehearsed to be kept alive in our short-term memories. The long-term or knowledge base consists of information that we have stored and can access when needed. Now this storage area has a seemingly unlimited capacity. The key to being able to access what is in our long-term memory is making sure that it is stored in a meaningful way as the child enters school and they begin to process information more quickly than before. Uh, now this processing speed is because they can find links and meaning in new information and so they're able to store it more easily. So that's an important part of teaching is finding links to what has happened to them before or part of their personal experience. So schooling often involves learning new strategies to help 
with these academic tasks. Uh, vocabulary continues to increase throughout middle childhood at a rate of about 20 words per day. Fifth graders know an estimated 40,000 words and they begin to understand the meanings of words and plays on words and grammar is more easily learned and rules of grammar are applied more flexibly. Now, let's talk a little bit about the psychosocial development because that's really the, the emphasis of this module. Uh, in middle childhood, when <clears throat> they're entering school, this often means entering the society or culture of children. Children establish a language, a set of rules, behaviors, and roles for one another. And this society of children can serve as a bit of a living laboratory for learning and practicing social skills, such as negotiation, communication, and problem solving. Now, think about the children you remember when you were in your early grades in school. You may remember some children who were known by many and were very well liked. These popular pro-social children are highly visible and seem to have the support and encouragement of the school. Some children are popular, but their popularity comes from altercations with other students and rebelliousness within the school. It may be hard for these children to change their social behavior as it has become part of their persona and their popularity. Now, some children are withdrawn and suffer the rejection of other children. They may have some qualities that make them a safe target for bullying, such as being poor, or having a physical challenge, or simply being shy. Now, aggressive, rejected children are rebellious and have altercations with other students. But this does not gain them popularity. And why is it this? It's because they are not normally, they, they don't have the attractive feature the arrogance that goes along with um, the rebelliousness. And they will sometimes suffer from, in the child's eyes, being not attractive or being poor or something else. So the social environment has a profound impact upon the child and we need to be mindful of that. School-aged children are forming a sense of self and a sense of self-concept. Of course, this begins earlier in life, but it continues to take shape in middle childhood. Now, in societies where media is powerful, children may develop evaluations of themselves based upon images or products in television shows or commercials or on the internet. Now, Eric Erickson believed that these children struggle with industry which is a stage of being busy and learning about one's capacity versus inferiority. So that values conflict between industry versus inferiority. Do I feel good about what I can do or do I feel inferior about what I do? So the question is, to what extent might a child feel inferior in these comparisons? To what extent are developmental needs addressed in the world that we establish for children? So we need to remember, we need to create places where children can discover that they are industrious, that they can succeed if they engage. Now many of the activities and products created for children may really be designed to meet adult needs rather than those of the children. So we need to be mindful of that. Children need a sense of success. Now think for example about an elaborate birthday party for a six-year-old and the parents put a lot of work in and they invite the entire neighborhood. That's really something for the parents to raise the parents prestige not for the six-year-old. 
And sometimes this false self-training um, where the child is held to an external adult standard can harm the child's development through a stage like this. Now, this brings us to other ways that a child can be harmed. And one of those ways would be, of course, child sexual development or child sex abuse. Uh, child sex abuse is a sexual act with a child that's performed by an adult, adult or an older child. The, develop, the developmental immaturity of the child is ignored and their needs are disregarded and this obviously will cause problems. For example, a young girl who begins physical maturation early may be considered to be sexual, although emotionally and cognitively she's not equipped to understand the sexual behavior and its implications. Now, some researchers describe the long-term consequences of childhood sexual abuse um, as traumatic sexualization. And this refers to the way in which a child who is sexually abused may learn to use sexuality and seduction as a major way to communicate with others. The person may devalue other aspects of who they are and have difficulty thinking of sex as and, and a love relationship as being part of a longer term relationship. A sense of betrayal and lack of trust is particularly strong in cases of, for example, incest. Uh, the child learned that secrecy and denial of the experience is expected and that those who are supposed to care for you can also be those who abuse you. A healthy understanding of an appropriate parent-child relationship, therefore, is lacking. And that trust, which we've already seen from previous weeks, is the foundation for this values development of trust versus mistrust, but that has been undermined. And a person may also experience a sense of powerlessness or an inability to set limits with others. And this may mean being involved in other abusive relationships or in being unable to say no to demands on either time or money or other resources. Now finally, the person who is abused may feel stigmatized or looked down upon by others. And this makes it difficult for the person to ask for help or find support or to be taken seriously in a compassionate way. Now, there are also um, crisis situations that can occur within middle childhood that can impact the child in terms of the systemic context of the child. Remember, we always live within systems and each system impacts other systems. So when we look, for example, at disruption to family systems as far as family structure and relationships go. Now, there are a variety of family forms and there isn't any ideal form. Uh, for example, two-parent intact families, single-parent families, cohabitating families. Um, the issue is whether or not there is stability in that family structure and whether the needs of the child are being met. Now, family tasks involve things like providing food, clothing and shelter for a child, encouraging learning, developing self-esteem, developing pro-social behaviors, nurturing their friendships, and providing a harmonious and stable environment for family life. 
And it's that last part that often is lacking the harmonious and stable environment for family life. Um, the breakup of families uh, uh, continues to increase and this has been accompanied by a great concern over the impact upon children. Things like divorce don't affect all children in the same way. We need to remember that there is significantly different genetic wiring for different children. So different children are going to be impacted by uh, relationship conflict and stress in different ways. But there is a third of children where this is going to impact them significantly emotionally. And the impact of family conflict and breakup um, is not only hard upon the child, but upon uh, the financial context that the child lives within and upon the stress that is involved with um, adjusting to custodial parenting and the, the change of context. And all of that can play into this. Now, there are some short-term consequences, for example, uh, for a child dealing with divorce. This will, would include things like a sense of loss, uh, grief over family members that are no part of, no longer part of the child's life, a reduced standard of living, adjusting tra transitions such as changing schools or moving and experiencing perhaps a relief from conflict that was there prior to it. Any kind of change can be stressful. Now, adults who experience divorce as children have a greater anxiety about their relationships. And sometimes they will have unrealistically high expectations for a partner, seeking the perfect partner to avoid future divorce. But as we know, it's hard to find perfection. And this can have long-term consequences for children. Um, and divorce can also have the, the hardship of a child being tied into a long-term financial hardship. And with this, this translates to less support for higher education and this translates into lower occupational attainment attainment and all of this then can have rippling effects upon the child so it just wants you to be mindful of the systems within the systems that take place then there's also repartnering and this is when parents develop new relationships after a breakup so remarriage is one type of repartnering, but sometimes repartnering can be uh, an even harder transition for children than the divorce of their parents. Uh, parenting that may have become more democratic with a single parent household may become very authoritarian, for example, when a new partner comes, becomes a part of the family. And there can be a difficult adjustment for the children. Uh, step parents may want to take a parenting role right away, but the child may want to establish a friendship relationship first. So there needs to be some negotiation that takes place. So repartnering can also mean changes in the amount of time and attention that the biological parents show to their children. The greatest involvement with children may occur before either parent has established a new relationship. The least involvement seems to occur when the father has established a new relationship, but the mother has not. The father may be spending more time with their, his new partner and children 
And so there often is greater tension between the mother and the stepmother than between the father and the stepfather due to an emphasis upon uh, traditional North American uh, maternal roles. So uh, that also brings us to uh, dating, repartnering uh, brings in the issue of parental dating. Uh, does a parent have the time or the money to date? All of that is things that need to be considered when uh, dealing with the middle child. And then there, of course, are step families and blended families and the adjustments that need to take place. And all of this can impact significantly the lives of children um, and you can see this very often times as children are struggling in middle school or, or elementary school um, in these middle stages the children uh, can be struggling to find their role or their position in the family and that can lead to a, a loss of performance or ability to adjust to the demands of school. So just all things that we need to be mindful of. And then finally I want to end with a little bit about moral development. Now we're going to focus primarily on Lawrence Kohlberg. Now Lawrence Kohlberg back in the 60s built on the work of Piaget and was interested in finding out how our moral reasoning changes as we get older. And he wanted to find out how people decide what is right and what is wrong. And in order to explore this area, he read a story containing a moral dilemma to boys of different age groups. And in the story, a man is trying to obtain an expensive drug that his wife needs in order to treat his cancer. The man has no money, and no one will loan him the money he requires. And he begs the pharmacist to reduce the price, but the pharmacist refuses. So the man decides to break into the pharmacy to steal the drug. And then Kohlberg asked the children, to decide whether the man was right or wrong in his choice. And Kohlberg wasn't interested in whether they said the man was right or wrong. He was interested in finding out how they arrived at such a decision. And he wanted to know what they thought made something right or wrong. And from there, he was able to track out and create a profile for moral development. Now he created six stages. We're just going to look at the broader categories of this for this lecture, but you can break this down into much more specific detail. But I just want to, to share a few things. The first few stages, so the pre-conventional stage, is something that is part of a fairly predictable biologically based reasoning. So the youngest subjects seem to answer based upon what would happen to the man as a result of the acts. So the direct consequences to the man. For example, they might say that the man should not break into the pharmacy because the pharmacist might find him and beat him up. Or they said that the man should break in and steal the drug and his wife will give him a big kiss. That's what makes right or wrong. Now both decisions are based on what would physically happen to the man as a result of the act. So this is a self-centered approach to moral decision making. And he calls this most superficial understanding of right and wrong pre-conventional moral development.
Then we come to conventional moral development, and this would be the highest that you would expect a child in, uh, a, in middle childhood under the age of 11 to reach, although they might show some post-conventional tendencies from time to time. Middle childhood boys seem to base their answers on what other people would think of a man as a result of his acts. So the external social views of others. For instance, they might say that he should break into the store and then everyone would think he was a good husband. Or he shouldn't because that is against the law. In either case, right and wrong is determined by what other people think. And this is conventional moral development. A good decision is one that gains the approval of others, or one that complies with the law, the rules. Rules become important, and the view of peers becomes important. And so Kohlberg calls this conventional moral development. Now, older children, older people, were the only ones to appreciate the fact that this story has different levels of right and wrong. And that's where we get to the post-conventional development. Right and wrong are based on social contracts established for the good of everyone or on universal social universal principles of right and wrong that transcend the self the rules and social convention for example the man should break into the store because even if it is against the law the wife needs the drug and her life is more important than the consequences the man might face for breaking the law or the man should not violate the principle of the right of property because this rule is essential for social order. In either case, the person's judgment goes beyond what happens to the self. It is based on a concern for others, for society as a whole, or for an ethical standard rather than a legal standard. And so this level is called the post-conventional moral development because it goes beyond convention or what other people think. Uh, and it goes to a higher universal ethical principle of conduct that may or may not be reflected in the laws. So it's here the kind of supreme justices that guide the thinking. Now, the thing to keep in mind is post-conventional moral development requires the ability to think abstractly. And often this is not able to be accomplished until the person reaches adolescence or adulthood. So we need to be mindful of that when we're working with children. Now, some other things to remember with moral development. The first thing is a lot of the ability to think morally is caught. It comes from hearing and learning and being in the presence of older individuals and how they are processing moral reasoning. So that helps to pull a child into a higher category of moral reasoning. So being around people that are adults that are discussing higher moral processing and issues of higher justice can be important for helping children to move up in these categories. That's the first thing. The second thing that I want to, to highlight here is a limitation of Kohlberg's work, and that is he primarily focused on males. Now, um, what other researchers have found is that there tends to be a bit of a difference between males and females when it comes to using Kohlberg's model. And so there's a Harvard researcher, she used to be at Harvard when she was looking at this, by the name of Carol Gilligan. 
Carol Gilligan argues that moral reasoning for women is not so much based upon this cognitive model of, of Kohlberg's, which is pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional, but rather on relationships and the nature of relationships and the value placed upon relationships. So the web of the network of relationships that a person has plays a huge role or a more important role with women than it tends to with men. So that's just some variations that I want you to be mindful of. That men tend to think in terms of these abstract structures. Women tend to think more in terms of the systems of relationships within moral development. And I will leave you there for this class. You take care. Bye-bye.